BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday. And on Wednesdays this year, I've been doing a regular segment about the Axeman of New Orleans, an unidentified serial killer mystery that took place in the early part of the 20th century. This is an ongoing series here on this channel, and to those of you who have been listening regularly, next week will be the final installment in this series, and then I will be revisiting the story of the Phantom Killer, a story from 1946. So I invite you to like and subscribe to follow along with all of these true crime discussions. And on that note, another announcement for the channel is that every Monday is Zodiac Monday, where I talk about the Zodiac Killer, and lately they've been coming out as the Zodiac Killer news reports. But some of them have the uh, writing at the end that says, plus true crime talk. And last week, I was talking about an unrelated case at the end, and I would like to keep going with that on the Zodiac Killer news reports, but focus more on serial killer mysteries or true crime cases that could be viewed as a type of comparing and contrasting, as well as just genuinely exploring something for the last five minutes of the show. I did some similar things on the channel this year when I did the Versus series, talking about two different true crime cases and comparing and contrasting them, such as the Zodiac Killer versus the Phantom Killer, the Zodiac Killer versus the Long Island Serial Killer, looking at how these different criminal minds operated, and what could be the possible psychological factors that were driving these people to commit the crimes, and most importantly, looking at the physical differences between the method of operations between two different serial killers, and even other criminals, particularly mass shooters, like I was discussing last week on the Zodiac Killer News Report, talking about the Plymouth shooter from the United Kingdom. So, there are going to be some additional elements that are going to be incorporated into the Zodiac Killer News Reports. And also, I think that it's very important to revise and to go back and look at some of the famous true crime cases and look at how they are incorporated into true crime literature, because that, the cases of the past have created the understanding of the present in terms of psychological profiling, in terms of forensics, in terms of how criminals get caught, the ones that we do know of and the ones that have been identified. So please look out for some new things on Mondays, and as I said, you can like and subscribe, but you can also share with your friends and family if you know somebody who is a fan of true crime. Feel free to share this episode with them as well as anything else here on Black Box All Night Radio. And you can also go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88. And that website allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the program. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. In this episode, I would like to talk about a theory in the New Orleans Axeman case. Because I've been reading the book, The Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story by Miriam C. Davis. And I began the series by talking about the book Ready to Hang by Robert Talon which discusses, you know, his own observations on the case from the 1950s. And he more or less had the theory that there was a single killer, and he leaned toward a particular suspect named Joseph Mumphrey. Miriam C. Davis attempted to correct some issues in Robert Talon's narrative with her own book, which came out 
in the recent years, well after Robert Talon's, but she also has her own theoretical observations, as opposed to just making a chronology and just documenting the facts of the case and putting it together like a narrative. She does insert her own opinions as well as her theory on what happened, more or less. And firstly, she incorporates the crimes that occurred well before the New Orleans Axeman of 1918 and 1919. Those are the canonical crimes. But going back to 1910, with a set of homicides and attacks called the Cleaver Attacks, and it really is the attacks because the majority of the victims survived, and no matter what theory people are going with, when we look at these crimes committed by the New Orleans Axeman or Axeman plural, attempted murder is perhaps almost more frequent than murder itself, but these are the crimes of the cleaver who used a meat cleaver, not an axe, but targeting the crudies, the rosettis, and the davies. And then there's an attack that takes place right after that, the attack on Tony Schiambra. A commonality is all of these people were of Italian descent, and they worked in the grocery store business. They either worked there or had it ownership of a small grocery store. A big difference, though, with the Schiambra attack is Tony Schiambra was not bludgeoned with an axe or a meat cleaver. He was shot, so that's going to factor into some issues here. But the mark that has been left on history isn't even so much was Tony Schiambra a genuine axeman victim. I'm going to tell you flat out now, I don't think so. But it's a story that becomes connected to the axe attacks that have been going on, and yes, axe attacks, because even though a cleaver was used in the second attack, it was actually a meat axe, which is just a heavier version of the cleaver, and the newspapers first reported that there was Jack the Axe Man was targeting New people in New Orleans, even though it's a meat axe as opposed to an axe for chopping wood, but we'll see that that will change, because then there's a hiatus of um, Axeman activity for about six years from 1912 to 1918 when the crimes start again. And that could easily be explained by somebody went to jail, somebody was stationed in the military, somebody moved to a different city for a business related issue, or maybe they were in a mental institution for some reason. Six years, there's a halt in Axeman activity. Then in 1918, there's the attack on the Maggios. And a message is written, which more or less sounds like it's written in some form of sidewalk chalk, although don't quote me on that, that says, Mrs. Maggio will sit up at night just like Mrs. Tony. And as you remember from that story I said about the man who was shot, his name was Tony Schiambra. Now the name was spelled differently. It was T-O-N-E-Y, and he spelled his name T-O-N-Y. But was it actually written by the killer? In the book, um, The Axeman of New Orleans, Miriam C. Davis argues, no, that was not actually written by the killer, because even though it's 1918, they don't have technology in the same way. Electronic communications, email, text messages, the DMs on Instagram. People were still able to share stories by word of mouth, gossip. The news can travel throughout the neighborhood. Person A tells person B, and that could have actually been written by someone making some type of sick joke or morbid humor, but not from the killer. That would be one particular observation that I would agree with. And, I mean, six years, and some people perhaps thought that Tony Schiambra was a genuine cleaver victim. I, being very clear once again, and I think Miriam Davis agrees, Tony Schiambra most likely was not. He was perhaps shot for a different reason. But... After the Maggios are attacked, there is one of the more famous Axeman attacks, and that is on Louis Bessemer and Harriet Lowe. A big differentiation with this is that Louis Bessemer was not Italian, Harriet Lowe was not Italian, Louis Bessemer was an immigrant from Poland, although he might have actually been born in present-day Germany, but um, the situation in Europe was messy, that's the politest way that I can put it. But... Louis Bessemer and Harriet Lowe are attacked in their home. However, everything that we have said to this point is that the Axeman and the Cleaver attacks are targeting people of Italian descent who work in the grocery business. Louis Bessemer did operate a grocery store, but 
not Italian. How, how does that tie into things? A theory that has now been established in the book by Miriam C. Davis is that Louis Bessemer and Harriet Lowe were not genuine Axeman victims, but then who attacked them? And at first, I think she presented the narrative as they attacked each other, that it was a domestic dispute that got completely out of hand. But she points that Harriet Lowe did die from her injury. She passes away, but a substantial t amount of time later, she's able to give numerous statements in the hospital, as well as even leaving the hospital to go out and visit the police station to give another statement. And more or less on her deathbed, she says that Louis Bessemer was the man who attacked her, and that she doesn't know what he struck her with the first time, but he definitely struck her with an axe the second time. So Miriam Davis tried to incorporate that into a particular narrative that she was in a dispute with Louis Bessemer. Maybe he picked up a blunt object or maybe even something similar to a cleaver and struck her inside their house. And then she is um, trying to run outside the house to run away from him. And they run out onto the porch and he grabs her and pulls her back in. And while he's doing that, he grabs the axe from the porch pulls her back inside and then strikes her in the head with the axe. And that maybe Bessemer's injury happened in the scuffle, maybe his injury was self-inflicted, maybe Harriet Lowe did it to him, but that Louis Bessemer would definitely have been the more aggressive party in that struggle, and that he was responsible for her murder. And the reason why she says that is there is no physical evidence of an intruder. And that's one of the reasons why Robert Alon titled his section in the book, Ready to Hang About the Axe Man. He called it the Axe Man Wore Wings, because he's just saying the Axe Man's almost just flying in and flying out and not leaving any evidence behind. And Miriam Davis's response is, well, that was because it's probably somebody in the house who was not an intruder, meaning Louis Bessemer. And there's some additional elements to the story that Bessemer seems like somewhat of a smooth talker, and Harriet Lowe is talking about how he has a trunk that has European documents in it, and he's just saying, well, he is a Polish immigrant, he's from Europe, he doesn't have any sympathy for the Germans, he's not German, you know, he's Polish. But he also has clothing that has lots of secret pockets, he has a trunk that has secret compartments, and his response is just, the secret compartments are for documents, the secret pockets in his clothing are to hide money when he is traveling, and um, for business-related reasons, as he said, he um, owns a store. So he had an explanation for everything. However, I tend to agree that Miriam Davis's theory might be correct, and that Bessemer was not a genuine Axeman victim, that Harriet Lowe was not a genuine Axeman victim, and that instead this was a domestic dispute that got out of control, mostly because it doesn't tie into anything else associated with the profiling. The Axeman is targeting grocery store owners and grocers of Italian descent, and then Bessemer and Lowe are not. And another example of an Axeman case where the victims are not Italian is the Schneider attack. And Mrs. Schneider is actually struck in her home but not with an axe immediately. She is struck with a lamp over the top of her head, and that, but then oddly, a hatchet and an axe were both stolen from the Schneider house, and they were found later on, as well as a dress that had blood on it, belonging to Mrs. Schneider, was found underneath someone's porch, and it was very odd, but one way to view that in terms of this non-Italian axe man victim is that was a genuine burglary gone wrong. Maybe Mrs. Schneider woke up, someone struck her with an axe, and because of the axe man stories that had been going around, somebody stole three things from the house, the hatchet, the axe, and the dress, and they just left them to confuse the authorities or put the blame on the axe man. But again, Harriet, uh, sorry, not Harriet, um, but Mrs. Schneider w would have been a, just someone who was a victim of a different criminal this gets back to the other Axeman attacks focusing on Italian victims. But one point that is addressed in Robert Talon's Ready to Hang is that there's a victim named Joe Romero who was murdered by the Axeman, 
and he is not a grocery store owner. He's a barber. And Robert Talon was talking about this hypothesis in his own mind that this could have been a case of mistaken identity because other people were reporting strange occurrences happening in the vicinity of Joe Romero's home at the time in 19, um, 18 and 19 thereabouts. And they were they were possibly targeting an Italian grocery store owner, but they simply thought that Joe Romero was working in that profession, but he was not. He was a barber, and they thought that um, they, it was a case of mistaken identity, got the wrong person. But Miriam Davis shows that Robert Talon's narrative might be half true and half false. Case of mistaken identity, yes, but what Robert Talon left out was that this is actually the Bruno Romero attack because they have two families that are more or less living right next to each other, and my understanding of it from reading the book is that they are neighbors or they have some type of adjoining house, something to that effect. And the niece of Joe Romero was a grocery store owner. She was a widowed niece, but she lived with the family. And again, they're living right next to each other. So did somebody possibly think, well, maybe the man, the Mr. Romero, owned the grocery store and he was the person who should have been targeted? That I can follow as well, because now we have a consistent pattern of behavior. The New Orleans Axeman is targeting grocery store owners of Italian descent, and I think that this is really starting to make sense now, and some of the crimes that have been attributed to the Axeman might not actually have been him. And I had the opportunity to ask that direct question to Miriam C. Davis once, and she more or less said that her theory was that there was an Axeman this wasn't some type of media hoax. This wasn't some type of fantasy-filled journalism. It wasn't some type of fictitious connection that has been put together between all of these crimes from 1910 to 1919. She believes that there was an axe man, but some of the crimes attributed to him were not him, and some of the crimes that have not been attributed to him were the axe man. Examples of crimes not committed by the axe man, the uh, attack on... Bessemer and Lowe, and possibly Mrs. Schneider, although she most definitely states that Bessemer and Lowe was most likely the result of Louis Bessemer himself. So that leaves us with the issue of, well, why? Why is this person attacking grocery store owners of Italian descent? Honest answer, I don't know. Second answer would be that they may have had some type of issue in their childhood. Maybe their parents were Italian grocery store owners and they wanted revenge in some type of twisted cycle of destructive behaviors issue. Or this could have been the Italian mafia in New Orleans trying to extort money out of people. But if that's the case, it's discussed in the book though. Well, where's the evidence of that? Where are the messages that are being left? Where's the threatening note that someone has? Why isn't someone saying on their deathbed that Oh yeah, the mafia is trying to extort money out of me. They're going to die, and are they trying to protect their family? Maybe. But my simple response is, the mafia angle has not a lot of evidence to support it. There is not a lot of hard evidence to say that the mafia is actually targeting these victims in New Orleans, because looking at the facts... Someone is breaking into people's homes, and they're striking them with either a meat cleaver or an axe. And that's where the hard evidence seems to end. Now, could this be somebody who's trying to put Italian grocery store owners out of business? Maybe he felt that an Italian owner put him out of business once, and he just wanted revenge on all of them. Something like that could be possible, but that doesn't require a mafia connection. That, again, goes back to a single perpetrator who is being cold, methodical, and calculating. And in the first interview that I ever heard with Miriam Davis on the Most Notorious channel, she was talking about the connections between the Cleaver attacks of 1910 to 1911, because Scambra is happening later on, but if we exclude him, which I already have done, 1910-1911, and then the six years of um, Axeman ceasing to attack people, and then restarting in 1918, she said she had spoke to a psychological profiler who said that almost certainly it's the same person because the, if the same crimes are happening in this way, 
then it should be the same person. And I did an episode about this on Black Box Online Radio where I was kind of erupting a little bit saying, that psychological profiler needs to go back to Psych 101. Just because two sets of crimes are similar doesn't mean it's the same person. Absolutely not. As a case in point, I would point to the Zodiac Killer mystery. Let's say, for example, you have the murder of Ray Davis in 1962, who was a taxi driver, and then the taxi driver, Paul Stein, was murdered in 1969. Similar crimes, but does it mean that they are the same person? I don't think so. Or how about the Domingo Edwards murders that occurred in 1963 is very similar to the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa stabbing. Does that mean it's the same perpetrator? I also do not think so. So, just because some crimes are, have, are committed in a similar way, it doesn't mean that it's the same perpetrator. However, I had to get off of my egotistical high horse for a little bit, something that I should do a little bit more often, but I'm not going to, and I had to actually look at what she was talking about in the grander scheme of things when I actually read the book, yikes, and it's that you have somebody who is a home invader targeting Italians who work in the grocery store business using almost the same method, the cleaver versus the axe. I mean, the axe was perhaps just a change because it was more convenient. This actually does sound like it could be the same person, and maybe that psychological profiler was onto something, that there is a commonality in the way in which these crimes are committed. Chiseling out the panel of a door, breaking into someone's home, striking them with an with a cleaver or an axe, not stealing any money. Although in the first attack on the crudies, the perpetrator did say something about wanting money, but it was not taken. So all of this is seen, is, it seems like it's tying together with a single perpetrator. But on to a more important issue. Did the Axeman actually take credit for his crimes in communications? I said very clearly that I don't believe that he took credit via that message that was written Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. I think that that was most likely someone who was doing a sick joke. But the next point is that there's a letter that's written after the Axeman crimes have been going on saying that someone is a demon out of hell or there's some type of spirit out of the hottest part of hell and that they're going to go on a kill rampage if a jazz band isn't playing in, in the home. And that people actually listened to that thread, and they did have jazz bands playing. And the alternative theory is that it was an out-of-work jazz musician who was trying to get employment for the night. Okay, even if that's not true, even if that's not true, I don't see an ounce of connection between this home invader who's striking people with that axe and someone who's just saying, Oh yeah, but I really like jazz music. I think it's kind of nice, so could you could you kind of play that for me so I don't kill you? I mean, I just think that that is absolutely not the same person, not the same set of mind, and I don't believe that that's an authentic communication. It is just somebody else trying to write a letter for their own self-serving purpose. And if that is correct, I mean, if, 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 right, if that is correct, then you don't have somebody who's actually trying to brag and take credit for the crimes, because there's a particular question that is asked to the readers in the book The Axeman of New Orleans by Miriam Davis, and that is that how did the Axeman respond to the media coverage about him? Because the newspapers were writing these stories about the Axeman. Did he think, oh, look at these idiots, they're trying to catch me, but they cannot? Or did he think, oh, these idiots, how dare they say these things about me in the newspaper? And did that just fuel his rage and his bloodlust and make him want to go out and kill more? I'm going to attempt to answer that for the sole fact that I like to run my mouth on the internet. And my honest response is, I don't think that he cared too much about the media coverage. Because everything we're seeing from the Axeman story is, there's this guy that is targeting people because he wants to inflict either pain or rage onto the victims. And most likely, I'm thinking that it's more about rage because he's not really trying to tie the victims down and torture them for an extended period of time. He's not stealing money, so he's not benefiting in a monetary way. He is not doing anything other than just unleashing a few moments of anger onto the victims. So I think he was more 
about committing the crimes themselves than caring at all about what was said about him in the papers as long as it didn't interfere with his ability to commit crimes. So how did he respond to the media coverage? I don't think it would have affected his behavior too much. Instead, I think that this is someone who had some psychological issues and was trying to unleash his um, rage, unhappiness, anger in a very destructive way. Some additional points about why this would not be a mafia henchman or hitman. As I said, there isn't a very big paper trail to support that. The second one is that it's actually addressed by both Robert Talon and Miriam Davis. The mafia was not known to target women and children, and the Axeman targeted men, women, and children. Very odd behavior for a serial killer if all of the Italian victims were even the Axeman. Most notably, the Cordomiglia attack where Mr. Mrs. Cordomiglia were attacked as well as their baby, Mary Cordomiglia, who passed away from her injuries. So that is um, just very different in terms of psychological profiling. Many serial killers will target adults, but they won't target children because they don't have animosity toward children. Serial killers have psychological reasons why they commit the crimes, but the Axeman doesn't seem to be doing that. But they're just pointing out that this is inconsistent with the activities of a mafia henchman. So this actually goes to show that it's somewhat of a deranged individual who is breaking into people's homes and just unleashing his anger, more or less, as opposed to actually creating this image of terror and destruction. And that's what I'm really getting from the Axeman vibes. I don't see that desire to scare people. Like, there's a saying out there, it's not a saying, actually, it's more or less an interpretation, that the Zodiac Killer wasn't so much a serial killer as he was a terrorist. He's threatening to go on kill rampages and blow up school buses full of children. He's creating fear in the general public. And the New Orleans Axeman doesn't actually seem to be doing that. It seems like some deranged person who is murdering people for some unknown reason, but it's just that. It's an unknown personal reason. And it's more about just striking them with the axe rather than making sure that they are dead, because so many of the victims survived. Even back in the Cleaver attacks, the Crudy victims survived. The Rossetti survived. It's not until the Davi attack when a victim actually passes away. My ultimate response is, it does actually seem like there is a New Orleans Axeman, and that some of the crimes attributed to him may not have been the Axeman, such as the Schneider attack and the Bessemer attack, and then some of the crimes that people aren't so sure about, like the Cleaver attacks. I could see how all of that ties in together. I wouldn't endorse all aspects of Miriam Davis's theory, despite what I just said. I'm still somewhat uncertain that the Cleaver attacks are the same person, but I think it's a much more defendable theory than I thought it was in the past. I would say the points that I'm most likely convinced of as of now is that Tony Schiamber was not an Axeman victim, Louis Bessemer was not an Axeman victim, and Harriet Lowe was not an Axeman victim, and I find the story about how Louis Bessemer killed Harriet Lowe in a domestic dispute, although, to be very clear, she passed away a very long time later in the hospital as a result of complications from her injuries. That appears to be um, a different situation and not the New Orleans Axeman. But what do you think about any of the ideas that have been expressed in this episode here? And what do you think about the particular challenge question? How do you think the Axeman would have viewed himself in the media, or how would he have responded to the media coverage about him? How would he have felt about that? You can speculate all you want, you can guess all you want. And what do you think about the observation that the victims who are not of Italian descent were not Axeman victims? And um, please share anything you want in the comments section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.